All right, all right. Y'all have been begging in every Year Zero video. Please react to S S Arthur H S. Please. Oh, okay, okay. I I'll farm him too. All right, Reezer is back. Season three, episode one, and last is cut content. Let's get it. After nearly four entire years, ReZero is back, and with it, so too is our beloved cast of characters and mansion. Wait, didn't that burn down? If you remember- We're homeless. But, we got a different mansion to stay at, because Roswell is a Margrave, and they rich as fuck. But, is the rant mansion back? After the one year, right? One year time skip. Is our mansion just back? Burned down. If you remember the terrible fire at the end of Season 2, don't worry, you're not mistaken. Yes, it burned to the ground. I'm not mm -hmm. really going to consider this cut content because you can just infer it. There was, however, a second mansion a bit yep. away from Arlem, but it's much more grandiose than the last. This no, it's, it's a completely separate mansion that we were we literally knew about you know, at the end of Season 2, right? ...move was achieved through one of the biggest revelations of the first episode, the one-year time skip. Do note that I will rarely be showing actual footage in this video so that I don't get two in the back of my head from Katakawa. A lot of things have been going on during the year. However, any written record of it- Fun fact, it doesn't matter if you show footage or not. A simple still frame is enough. If Karokal wanted to pursue copyright strikes flagrantly, they'll just do it. Like, it doesn't matter if the footage is moving or not. It genuinely doesn't matter. Thank you, Doom Jin, for five gifted subs, man. Very generous of you. It was adapted to decide stories, which likely will never see the light of day in terms of adaptation. Maybe I'll make a video about the time skip side stories, but for now, we can assume they- I want to know the time skip Priscilla content. What the hell did she do to get the clout that Amelia has right now after Amelia's camp has basically slain two of the great witch beasts? I know the rabbit's not subjugated just yet, it's just in a different portal dimension. As well as Betrugus. What the hell did Priscilla do? She must have been cracked as well. He did things. For our own camp, we see the obvious progression of Betty and Subaru's relationship becoming quite the strong, inseparable duo. Mm -hmm. Amelia's studies have been paying off, learning more about the inner workings of Lagunica, as well as rounding out her own confidence. Subaru has- Amelia's studying actually matters? Like, is, is she just getting educated, basically, about Lagunica? Very clearly got better at keeping up appearances, being praised for showing restraint in this episode, and not immediately blowing a fuse when Julius might have been at the mansion, and Garfield has found his own place in the camp as Amelia's shield. Some people were wondering what happened to the royal selection in Season 2. Well, Season 3 wastes no time at all, giving us our first update. Mm -hmm. At the start, it was Krush, Anastasia, and a bunch of nobodies. However, Krush- That's right, a bunch of nobodies were literally like Amelia was the fifth member to join the queue so the game can get started. The lobby needed a fifth member. Roswell literally was like, well, Amelia, uh, hey, just treat her like a random to just, you know, fill the fucking party so we can start the game, right? These two definitely weren't the lead, but it's crazy how Krush has such an early lead, but due to the events with Gluttony, Lie Bikentos, now it's looking like probably the worst. And Amelia and Priscilla now are kind of high up. Anastasia is doing really well too and felt to showing promise. Has notably fallen off after being gluttonied with Anastasia maintaining a firm lead. This does not mean that the other candidates are irrelevant, however. Amelia gained clout from killing Petal Juice and the White Whale. Priscilla gained clout for ruling over her dead husband. How the fuck does she only gain this much clout? If the amount, if the clout is scaling proportionate to the amount these characters are being raised, are you kidding me? White Whale, Great Rabbit, Petrigus Romani Conti. This fucking kingdom couldn't do shit! This previous source saint fucking failed and died, quote-unquote. Like, like, hello? And then you tell me Priscilla just being a... You, you tell me Priscilla just getting into a marriage and probably assassinating her husband to take his assets is better than Amelia? Land and moving the people there, which you could read about a side story. Felt, who only had Reinhard, has been flexing her... Are you serious?! This bitch that hasn't done anything but gather the support of a bunch of, bunch of fucking homeless motherfuckers in the slums? They're better than Amelia? No. I don't take this. No. Amelia should be at the fucking top with Priscilla slightly below it, depending on what, it's, what Priscilla did. Maybe she's as equal, just as high. There's no way! Amelia's second last right now. That's crazy! Skill at recruiting the lower strata and finding their strengths and instituting massive reforms. We immediately open- That's- that- that's fucking crazy. This is absolutely insane to me. Now, I don't know how much emphasis, right? Mr. Asarat, uh, Asaratha, fuck his name is hard to say. Asaratha? Asaratha. Like, if the amount the character are raised vertically is proportionate to the clout that they've got, like, like, um, sorry, the rankings, right? Anastasia, like, Amelia dead, like, second last? There's no way. Unless, 
I'm just that ignorant to the ReZero story. And I have a misconception of how much prestige and, you know, merit that we've earned by subjugating the White Whale and Betrugu from Conti in the same fucking day a week after this selection started into the Great Rabbit. That's crazy to me. That's mind-blowing to me. That Fel can do nothing but just rally the fucking support of the fucking homeless people in the slums. Priscilla just fucking just killing her husband, probably. There's no way, right? Or maybe the miscontent truly does portray Felt and Priscilla better than Amelia. Maybe it does. ...their strengths and instituting massive reforms. We immediately open up with our premise for this arc, Anastasia's invite to the Watergate city of Pristella to get Amelia a new crystal to hold Puck. She is a half-devil after all. Good point. Right? Maybe we can blame racism for the lack of... Well, we don't... Yeah, again, this little scaling does not matter. It's a fucking visual cue just to kind of portray different characters and how well they're doing. But there definitely could be a, 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 a talking point for how even if Amelia has achieved greatness, right, the camp has through Subaru's efforts, uh, maybe the racism is preventing the clout from being recognized. To the Watergate city of Pristella to get Amelia a new crystal to hold Puck. But wait, where is he? Inside. You see, Puck is a spirit, and spirits need something known as an anchor to recharge in, which is that crystal that hangs around Amelia's neck. Okay. There are two issues, however. One, as a great spirit, Puck needs a ton of mana to return. And second, the crystal that Amelia is currently using is a low-grade crystal that Puck it's has a trash. hard time manifesting from. What we have to wonder is, what is her angle? We've seen the lengths Anastasia is willing to- I am theorizing that Anastasia somehow knew ahead of time, due to her information network, that Pristilla was going to be under attack by the Archbishops. I think that she gathered all of the royal candidates, given them a reason to show up. Minus Priscilla. We didn't even invite Priscilla, apparently, right? And she's simply getting the better of us right now. Yep, even if there is good incentives for us to show up, my tinfoil theory is she knows exactly what's about to happen, and she is letting, she's offloading the pressure onto the other candidates and their camps that's showing up to go to play people, like Subaru in Arc 3, but we just aren't sure what she has to gain from giving Amelia exactly what she wants. We're then introduced to Joshua, Julius's brother, who is a crazy glazer, and it- Not Joshua, it's Yoshua. I fucking hate how the J is just a Y in Japanese. Julius, Yoshua, ugh. Fits. Julius' character so far has been about his desire to keep up his, the, this nightly appearance, something this episode will explore more later, so it really only makes- I think that nightly appearance is holding Julius back, and I think that even if you can have pride in being such a chivalrous knight, again, Super literally said Julius is hiding his heart with the knightly armor, and maybe you should take that off and just be Yuli instead, be yourself. Says that his brother would feed into that mentality of his. Joshua delivers the message, and the crew lets Roswell know what they are doing, to his frustration, as there are things Amelia should be doing right here, right now, but as a direct result of Arc 4, he can do nothing but let her go, as he has been forced to grant her her own autonomy after losing to Subaru. Welcome to the water- Unfortunate that Roswell will not be participating, most likely, in the first eight episodes of the- It's called the attack arc, right? Of arc five. Roswell being with us would be so nice, right? It would be so amazing to have Roswell to support us with all his magic, but... I don't expect other people to show up and be able to save us outside of Pristilla. I feel like somehow we need to, like, survive within those, like, first eight episodes. Then I'm guessing that, like... The counterattack is when we get out of Pristilla and hit the cult in their HQ. I don't know exactly how that's going to work out, but that's my guess. Like a different scenery from the first eight episodes and then the, the later eight episodes to finish, you know, arc five in, I think, sometime February. Forced to grant her her own autonomy after losing to Subaru. Welcome to the Watergate city of Pristella, and as you might have noticed, this location is going to be integral to the arc going forward, so let's recap some of the things we learned about it. First of all, this is a city that sits in the middle of a lake, using a massive tower meteor to control the inner workings of the city to allow mm -hmm. for different directions of flow. The water rises and stuff like that, and I think that it's definitely possible, if not 100% guaranteed, that we will see Subaru drowning by water. It's gonna have death by water. I think Tape really likes to explore different ways to make Subaru suffer as he dies. And we haven't gotten the drowning section yet, right? So drowning by water, I think will be amazing in terms of how he can portray all these feelings of desperation that one encounters when literally drowning. Let's see how well they like portray that to feel like realistic. 
The reason why this death trap was built is because, well, it's a death trap. This city was constructed. Death trap for what though? Pre calamity, this was a death trap. I think that this could have been a city designed to trap a dragon. Maybe the Witch of Envy. I'm not sure if the, how the timeline really works, uh, matches up because this is past 400 years ago. But are we going prior 400 or are we going a little bit within those 400, right? It, it could be dragon, could be witch, could be a great witch beast, maybe? Uh, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. If, if Daphne at that time, timeline wants, if it makes sense that Daphne has already created them. Maybe, but something about me feels like I want it to be like a dragon because we haven't gotten anything about the dragon just yet. For the sole purpose of trapping something. However, the records on what that might have been have been lost. Why would a trap become such a giant city for people to live in? There's also kind of a bombshell in this episode that gets treated as something sort of not that big of a deal. This city is inspired from Kawaragi style mm -hmm. construction, which Japanese. is in turn inspired by Japanese style construction, mm -hmm. which in turn means that there was someone out there 400 years ago. Yes, Hoshin of the Wilderness, right? This is a being that existed pre-Calamity times. He is dead now. He has influenced Japan. Sorry, he's influenced, you know, this world with Japanese culture. Kansai dialect, right? Kararagi style. There's even like an idiom that Garfield uses in season two about how Hoshin of the Wilderness and something about the city of Banan, right? About how he just like grazed the entire city because they didn't listen to him. Who was isekai and led to the founding of the Kawaragi city-states. This is a consequence of an earlier cut that we will touch on in the cut content section at the end of the video, but with the lore of it being a trap being inspired by Japanese architecture and its unique construction, leads us to a very interesting setting for Arc 5. Mm -hmm. This first episode is wonderful for a lot of reasons, but one of my favorites is how it spends a vast majority of its time just relaxing. There has been so little time to chill out since Arc 2, and we get just a really good episode of character dynamics and interaction. I'm sure it may be slow for some people, and if you feel that way, that's fair, but it's great groundwork for character relationships in general. People fucking hate this part of the show, man. People hate it when the show develops more of the side supporting characters by having slice of life moments. I can't understand that. Stuff like this only makes the pop-off even better as you're more immersed to the story. You care more about the different characters. You understand what the fuck the story is telling you about. But the average retard watching this has no patience for such things. They just want to see fights happen. They want to see an archbishop. They want to see something pop off, right? ...characterization, whether it be Amelia's growing confidence or Subaru's reigning in his own toxic behavior or the growth of Subaru and Julius's friendship watching... Is there any growth in their friendship? If Subaru actually acknowledged Julius as a friend, I would maybe say so. Subaru really hates him. And Tape is making it very clear that, like, this is not going to be a friendship like Otto and Subaru. You know, Subaru refuses to yield to Julius. I'm not sure if this is a rivalry. I don't know. But they're really making it clear that they do get along, but they don't get along. They can have heartfelt dialogues and, and talk about some very vulnerable moments about how Yuli's heart, right, is, sh he's, is armored by that knightly presence and that he should, you know, get rid of that. And Yuli is telling Subaru that, like, your righteous self-indignation is something that everyone wanted to say, but thank you for saying that on behalf of everybody during the Van Austria family drama, right? But it's just like, they don't get along. And Tape is like, yup, they beefing. Garfield LARP outside the carriage and a personal favorite of mine, Subaru going to Rub's bedside to tell her about his day presumably every night, or getting to see sides of characters we haven't seen before. Make sure to leave Priscilla. a comment on your favorite scene of this episode down below. Priscilla showing up way more is so fucking nice to me. Now, before I continue, is there any actual spoilers in this video? Right? We're talking about potential spoilers from the trailer because this dude is using trailer footage and we're even actively trying to prevent trailer footage, right? Has anyone actually seen this video? And no of spoilers. I will literally not continue until one monkey says so in chat. You motherfuckers wanted me to watch this, so I'm watching it. Surely someone knows. Surely someone knows. Nobody has done their due diligence. You just link this shit and you just say watch it. Nobody knows, huh? Just trailer footage is bad. Because the trailer footage fucking spoils. That's why we only checked out the preview. All right, let's just sit here in awkward silence. Spoilers? Where? Where is the spoilers? Don't fucking just say spoilers. 
timestamp it. Timestamp it. I'm literally just gonna handle my YouTube upload schedule right now until you guys give me a timestamp. I'm not continuing this shit. 440 until when? Up until 440? You're when does the spoilers part? Is my question. You can't just fucking type 440, then nothing after that. Why are you so slow? Are you saying the spoiler happens at 440? Like, type full fucking sentences. Don't write random fucking words. You're already talking to me from like five minutes ago because you're a mobile viewer that has so much delay. It's even harder to understand what any of you are saying. Skip to 440 for now. All right, let's do that then. 440. Boink. All right, here we go. I already seen this scene from, you know, a kid nut. It crumbs even before the end, like with Regulus appearing and bumping into the camp. This should have been a quick shock to those having a good time watching a silly character moment as well. However, Amelia can't quite seem to place where she knows him. A nerve-wracking plot thread. It's fucking annoying how Amelia doesn't know. Amelia should 100% know. She saw him. But it's been one year. She also saw him in a trial. And those memories are very fuzzy. And on top of that, Regulus is supposed to be this average looking person in the source material. And if you combine all of those things, it does make sense why Amelia wouldn't have recognized. Red left lingering. The Amelia camp runs into ratchets from the alleyway, and we learn that the three stooges have joined the Felt camp, which yeah. is a cool way of not just telling, but also showing Felt's prior mentioned skill of finding people with talent that have been left behind. Since Felt camp is here, so too is the man himself, Reinhard. Reinhard is training. Ratchins, dumb, dumber, and dumbest, bro. How strong are they at this point after being trained by a source saint? Reinhardt's presence alone sends a shock down Garfield's spine, and he goes on the offensive immediately. This little interaction actually gives us quite a bit to chew on, especially in terms of Garfield. First, we're shown even more of Reinhardt's humble side, being the one to apologize even though Garf lashed out at him and attacked him. His strong aura being something that he feels remorse over, and he wants to hear the story of the White Whale from Subaru sometime, which is an obvious connection that most might have missed since him and Wilhelm are related. Garf from this confrontation... Did people miss that? I thought everyone fucking knew that Wilhelm and Reinhardt, they're like grandson and grandfather. I thought most dudes... Well, I guess it was never confirmed, right? No, no one really, like, it, it wasn't specifically said in the anime, but I, I just made that assumption. That most might have missed since him and Wilhelm are related. Garf, from this confrontation, is also humbled. He was the strongest of the sanctuary, but after being dragged into the wide real world, he is forced to confront not that there are people stronger than him, but to meet the strongest ever. Yep. And while he faces that ego defeat, we learn that he has been haunted by the vestige of the woman he killed this whole time. I love this. Garfield having a literal battle shonen monologue. He's going off in his own little world. He's talking about his lack of power. He desires to be stronger than Reinhardt. Garfield, bro, I don't know what they're cooking with him. Especially because now he's in an evenly more emotionally vulnerable and like volatile state. Because he also saw his mom. And there's this power insecurity. Everything is cooking up. And you have Mimi. And why do you think Mimi matters here? Because I think that Mimi's gonna fucking die. There's been way too many cute and wholesome moments happening with Mimi. That can only mean bad thing can happen. If Garfield also then loses Mimi, right? I think we have the perfect storm for Garfield to have an emotional explosion for him to pop off. The vestige of Elsa taunts his weakness and that the only reason he killed her was because of chance. These two things coupled with meetings with the kids show us a clear trajectory for Garfield going forward. When Garf saves the kids and they ask him what his name is, you'll notice that even though people in the series- Bro, you said that you're not gonna use footage. You said that you're not gonna use footage because you're scared of Katakawa. Then you immediately- Okay, just be- Okay, first of all, it doesn't matter if a footage is running or not. Fun fact, if, a, if someone wants to manually strike you, they're gonna fucking do it whether or not you have a timer-based reaction, whether or not you have an edited reaction, whether or not you use the still frame or a moving frame, none of that shit fucking matters. But I'm just upset that this isn't consistent here because these frames are moving. Forward. When Garf saves the kids and they- Because I guess in his mind, he thinks if season three content is moving, Katakawa will come after him. But season two content is fine right now, which is 
None of that logic makes sense. Ask him what his name is, you'll notice that even though people in the series love giving up their names as a method of respect for both the fighter and themselves, Garf says that his Gorgeous doesn't matter tiger. and tells them to just call him Gorgeous Tiger. That's because Garfield's identity has been tied to being the strongest. And as he continually takes these mental L's, he's left to wonder if he's worthy of his own name. And then the final bombshell for Garfield's day, his mom- I did love how everyone did the same pose at Garfield. Subaru's pose is, is gonna get spread, bro. I think that at the end of this arc, Liliana will make a ballad, a song about the heroics of the legend that is Natsuki Subaru. And maybe one day there's also going to be a statue of him doing this fucking signature pose. And the kids also doing that pose along with Garfield, I think is really cute. And like maybe in the future, that'll be like the hero pose that goes down in centuries in this culture. It's worthy of his own name. And then the final bombshell for Garfield's day, his mom is alive and well. Wah, PTSD wah. visages, losing a fight instantly. Actually, this is not not a want-want situation. This is a happy situation. But it's sad, because I guess she has two extra kids now? No, that's not sad. You should be happy that you have, you have more family. It's just that mom doesn't recognize Garfield, and Garfield doesn't know what to do right now. ...and a lack of self-confidence coupled with finding out that your mother has been alive this whole time, but seemingly can't even recognize There's you. There's a lot going on Garfield right now has Garfield. an extremely rocky road ahead of him. We cut away from Garfield's worst day ever to see more camp members arriving at the inn. And right now, Garfield and Mimi are missing. Right? Currently, right, when Sirius is attacking, right? Garfield and Mimi are missing. Who knows where the hell they went? Ricardo apparently has not come back. I have no clue what he was sent out for, but there's a lot of moving pieces in the puzzle right now. This is when we get even more information on how far Anastasia is willing to go, as Krush is here to receive information on Gluttony. It leaves us with a question. What is the Felt Camp here for? Emilia yeah, I, I rewatched this episode multiple times, and there was a reason, right, for everyone to show up. For Amelia's side, it was all about, you know, the magic stones and a way to basically help, you know, Puck materialize. For Krush, it was about Gluttony. But during the di discussion, Anastasia carefully kind of stirred the shit pot and mentioned the gluttony because she knows exactly how much important for Subaru as well, right? But those are the incentive. Felt, when I looked, when I listened to the scene again, and, you know, it's fucking Crunchyroll subs are not the best, but that's what we got right now. It seemed like Felt was talking about how she loved things that was exciting and different changes like her entire thing is about toppling the existing structure that exists in Lagunica which is very ironic because bang red eye blonde hair these are the core qualities of a Lagunican royal family and she is indeed the lost princess that got kidnapped 15 years ago which happened when Heinkel you know was there when Wilhelm had to be separated due to the kidnapping situation and Theresia quote-unquote died but Felt's entire thing is about overthrowing the status quo topple you know she's basically an anarchist and she likes the theme of anarchy is change right and she talked about how she enjoyed how everything was so different and there was change here to anastasia and to that i thought huh i guess felt didn't really need a gift she did not need like a specific like reward for showing up she, the basically the gift or the reward the incentive is literally just to visit a different scenery Julia is here for the crystal cruise is here for gluttony priscilla arrives for fun so what is Felt getting out of this encounter? What I just we said. We get a really nice scene with Subaru and Wilhelm under the- What I just said, right? Or am I literally just reaching and have no understanding what I'm saying, simply trying to do mental gymnastic and piece in different themes of the characters in the show to come up with my own schizo theory, which is not true? Or is there an actual different reason that's hidden right now? There, is, there, is there some tangible reward, a specific thing? Or is she just here for the change? I don't know. It, it seemed like they really brushed that part off, right? Because like, I, I carefully rewatched it and nothing talked about what Felt was getting, except that Felt was happy to be here because of the change. For the moonlight, Wilhelm imparts something nice to Subaru about his wife, that a hero is not a hero all the time, which are some powerful words to hear because Subaru has kind of a hero complex, and maybe it plants a seed in his brain that it's okay to not be a hero all the time, and that Subaru's power lies within the power of others. That line is very interesting too because there's this line that gets often said to Reinhardt, once from Puck and once from Subaru during Trial 3 in Season 2 for Amelia in the future, where they both say, Reinhardt, you're simply a hero and that's all you'll ever be. Which is contradicting to what Wilhelm just said about how a hero is sometimes not always a hero. They have different roles, right? Theresia loved flowers and she wanted to do just different things that a lady might want to do. But she was forced to take on the sword because, you know, sword saint status. 
I wonder if that's kind of supposed to play in with Reinhardt always being a hero. Perhaps Wilhelm sees in Subaru what Wilhelm wishes he was at a younger age. Young Wilhelm is deeply documented in the Willogy or EX2, EX3, and soon to be EX6. He was a selfish asshole who didn't work well with anyone and mostly kept to himself, but Subaru has- Yeah, the more of Wilhelm's backstory that we get, the more we realize... Wilhelm kinda sucks. <laughs> you know? E even like, Teresa Wilhelm first meeting, bro was so fucking edgy and prideful and arrogant, just like Subaru. Subaru and Wilhelm, I think there's a lot of similarities that we saw in Season 1. And now that we hear more things about what happened with Reinhardt back in the past, for sure it's a very heated moment where his wife was killed by the grandson. It's a fucked up situation, right? He also never said, I love you. True. He never said, I love you out loud. Just Wilhelm is a terrible person the more I learn about him. And like, he's basically, right now, Wilhelm is so cool, right? At this age, it took him how many, I don't know how many years, but the ripe old age of maybe 70, maybe 80, who knows? He's like a very chill and a wise and a humble person. But like, you look back into the past, oh my god, this is an edgy demon. He's been steering clear of that path as time goes. This interesting Astraea family drama is only made more interesting by the introduction of the Priscilla camp, or more specifically, Heinkel Astraea. Specifically- Fun fact. The moment, the specific line that triggered Priscilla to uppercut Heinkel with the fan and draw the Yang sword, was this. There was a couple lines said before, right? There was basically, Priscilla was saying, hey peasant, stop it. And Heinkel was like, no Priscilla, this is like important to me. I need to let them know what they're talking about. And I need to also let them know that I am back. And then the one that I am backing, right? As soon as he said, the one that I am backing is, and then Priscilla, I think at that point, in my own headcanon was, she was so pissed off that this piece of shit peasant would dare mention her name in the presence of others that she just popped off and, and drew the Yang sword. Drawing the Yang sword is such an insane fucking reach. Even if it's a like a temper tantrum, like, she almost tried to kill him. Maybe it was a demonstration of power that she wanted to show to other people, flexing that like she is not to be fucked around with, but that scene went crazy. ...not receiving the commemorative van to celebrate achievements. He is the vice captain of the Royal Guard of Laguna, By title. a belligerent drunk who doesn't care about making a fool of himself at this meeting. And he definitely And he's not Von Austria. He's Heinkel Austria. Von seems to be associated with people who are sword saint status or is a great swordsman. Heinkel is a vice captain by prestige, by perhaps bureaucracy and nepotism, because he is the Austria family, right? He is a son of Theresa and Wilhelm. I'm sure he has a high ranking and like political political clout. He also has the Austria assets. And that's why Fel says, this fucking old man, our fate lies within his, you know, palms. I think that he has a terrible first impressions to most people, and we're gonna think the worst of him. But apparently, Tape said that if Subaru wasn't in ReZero, Heinkel would be the main character. Isn't that crazy to you? It shows you that this drunk belligerent fool is so deep and complex and there's so much room to cook, right? And I'm sure there's a reason why he's drunk. I'm sure there's a lot of fucked up things that's happened in life for him to turn out like this. I mean, his son literally killed his mom. Now, we were theorizing in the video that maybe Heinkel was the one that ordered the kidnapping of Felt 15 years ago in order to create an excuse to basically remove Wilhelm from the picture in order to get Theresia assassinated during the White Whale subjugation so that Heinkel himself would then become the sole owner, inheritor of the Astria assets. One could reason that, but the more I think about it, I think that this is a tragic character, a tragic person that needs some time to cook and people will realize the greatness in the story writing. They add some juicy layers to the drama. He accuses Reinhardt of killing Theresia, the sole cause of the Astraea Rift, and reveals that he has refused to give Reinhardt the Astraea estate, showing a strong disdain for even his own son. If Felt wins, she can just topple the entire existing system, and the inheritance shit probably won't matter. Felt anarchy, just toppled the status quo, is pretty compelling because all of this bullshit will go away. Right now, we live in a feudal monarchy where, you know, great families have these rights to pass on, you know, assets to others. But if Felt becomes the true ruler, then, like, none of this shit fucking matters.
There's also a good moment when Heinkel tries to poke at Amelia's heritage by calling her a half-devil, but in stark Hanma. contrast to the Amelia of old, she is unfazed by such provocations, Based. not biting his bait, and instead continuing her line of questioning. Raw points for that alone, and- Yeah, it was great. Amelia stood up. And the fucked up part is, when Reinhardt and Wilhelm were getting tortured by Heinkel, no one said anything in the room, but the moment that Amelia clapped back, every other girl also was like, yeah, slay. Who is this loser? Get out of here. It's like, goddamn, ladies, you could have fucking held Reinhardt and Wilhelm too. You, you just sat in silence until Amelia said something. It's good payoff for Arc 4. Priscilla reveals that she brought Heinkel here for fun, saying she rewrote the script of the Astraea reunion. Al tries to mediate, but you can only do so much with Priscilla. And in the immediate aftermath... And I think that scene where Priscilla literally just tapped Al's abs and this did that much damage, the fact that she was holding the Yankster with one hand, in the fan uppercut, Priscilla has superhuman strength like Amelia, I think. And in the immediate aftermath, for the first time, some cut content is re-added, but it's not the whole picture. When Subaru and Julius are talking, they reference a royal that was kidnapped 15 years ago. Belt! That was cut from Arc 3. However, that is only half of the cut content, and something in this very conversation also gets cut. I know some people are sensitive about cut content, so I'll save it for the cut content. I always love cut content, as long as it's cut content that is up to where we are in the current story. If there's cut content, future cut content, fuck that. But if it's anime episodes we've seen, and it's cut content regarding those episodes, I'm all for it. ...content section at the end of the video, but because of that kidnapping, Wilhelm was occupied and Teresia was killed by the White Whale. This conversation offers more cool Julia's characterization, showing us further how he will stick to tradition and knightly values, thanking Subaru for doing what he wishes he could and smiling as he thinks of the world Julie was able to see. Yes. The second to last scene is... Maybe this arc will make Julius throw away his knightly chivalry and become more raw and become the inner mercenary that is Yuli that we saw in season one. Priscilla dancing with Liliana, and it's one of the only times in the story we see Priscilla break away from the character we would expect of her. Yes, this is the one time where... Priscilla is also dancing, right? We would never expect Priscilla to dance, but not just a dancing. It's... Her entire attitude towards Liliana when Liliana denied Priscilla's invitation to join her camp. Priscilla said, my bad? My fault? That never fucking happens! Priscilla is always so arrogant and prideful and just admonishes everyone else and thinks them as peasants beneath them. But to Liliana, it's because Liliana showed the bard's pride, I think. Also, she's an exceptional songstress. Maybe something about the song manipulated Priscilla's brain. Maybe that too. Maybe you were fixated too much on too much on how Liliana portrayed herself and her pride as a bard, and that resonated deeply with Priscilla's personality. That's why she, you know, said, "My bad, and everything is fine." Because at the end of the day, my entire world is my possession, and I do not need pieces in my garden so close to me for them to enjoy. Maybe there's something about the song, man. And I want to believe that the song will also be able to break people out of Sirius's authority. I think that there is potential for Liliana's songs to counter Sirius's authority in terms of the trance-like hypnotism that was going on. But beyond that, did this song affect Priscilla? Did this song affect Subaru when he started rapping and understood the lyrics did everything? I don't know. Her mentioning of scripts, stages, and now dancing to the music, Priscilla clearly has some respect for the likes of artistic endeavors and performances, and we see another side of her along with Subaru and Amelia when Priscilla doesn't just cut Liliana in two, respecting her wishes when she refuses her request. Best part is Priscilla will never look in the way of these two idiots. Priscilla will always have her fan up and stare the other way because she's too good for them. She is just so extra. As if Priscilla inherently respects people who get who they are, as Liliana understands that she wants to follow her lineage as a traveling bard. Subaru is forced to go get snacks, and we get this phenomenal- Do you think there's appas in this bag? We already saw multiple appas in the background scene to further complement the forbidden appa theory, which is if there's ever an appa in this show and people are interacting with it, or something is like engaging with it, bad things are gonna happen. I wonder if Subaru actually had Appas in the bag. Like, we, we don't know anything about that. It's just in the bag. I don't know. Little scene with Sirius Romani Conti, the Sin Archbishop of Wrath, ranting and raving about love, and for some reason, everyone just strangely gives in to that speech, and Authority. it seems like a switch of sorts was flipped when she clapped her hands. Yes. Near the end of 30, it took 30 seconds for you to pay attention. She clapped right at that point. I think we were, we were in a trance-like state. 
but I don't think that at that point we would take the shared damage if, you know, that kid fell, meaning that there's potential for a songstress Liliana to break them out of this trance. The scene, everyone in the crowd has red eyes, meaning that these two aspects are likely related to her authority, mm -hmm. but there is something to dissect with her speech here. Rizio introduces a multitude of ideas of love, especially through Sin Archbishops. That's right. The theme of love is a very abstract thing that means different things to many people. To Juice, he is a very diligent person that hates sloth. He actively punishes sloth, and when someone is slothful, he says that we need to pay for our sins with love. We need to pay back with love. I, I, I. Right? What does that really mean? Be basically just be very diligent, work harder, make sure that the day of the ordeal is set up properly so that we can confess our sins and, you know, um, relish in them. Kind of like the Christianity, you know, religion, right? You sin and you want to pay back the sins by doing good deeds. That's kind of what the love is for better use that I noticed when analyzing his dialogue in season one. Through Saint Archbishops, Petal Juice Romani Conti had a possessive type of love that mirrored Subaru's entitled nature in Arc 3. Mm. And we see another perspective from Sirius, I don't know if that's his wife or what, that she proposes through Lustful and Tina. Is putting your life on the What? Sirius, I don't know if that's his wife or what, that she proposes through Lustful and Tina. What? She proposes through Lustful and Tina? For what? That she proposes through Lustful and Tina. I have no clue what that means. She proposes through Lustful and Tina. My bad. It's the name of the kids. True. My bad. It's putting your life on the line like Lustful is doing. Love is sacrifice of love. It is love when your heart is one. Well, I do think that there are all the heart is one is a very important thing that goes beyond just like the metaphors, but more of like when the heart is one, we take the shared damage because everyone is together. Everyone is feeling the same emotion. Sirius also called out specific people in the audience and how they were feeling annoyed that they were being stood up for their time. Subaru was one of them. There's two other co two NPCs. I don't think they matter as much, but that kind of shows that Sirius's authority, her power, she knows exactly how other people are kind of feeling. Honorable ideas of self-sacrifice, as sin archbishops tend to do, they take it to an extreme, and I do not believe that two people becoming one is what love is, but toxic dependence. As Sirius espouses her ideals, she drops Lost Bolt to the ground, killing the entire town square, and forcing Subaru's first reset in over a year. Mm -hmm. The crushing feeling of that revelation hitting his brain all at once, alongside the memories of him cheering at a boy's death. Exactly. I didn't understand at the time of the reaction, but the more I thought about it, him repeating, I'm sick, I'm sick, it's more than just like, oh shit, I just regressed for the first time in a year. Oh no, this is happening again. It's, it's that and I cheered actively for Luz Bill's death. Everyone was cheering the entire time. Whenever Subaru dies and does a reset, right? Yes, there's a Shadow Garden moment that happens. Shadow Garden is like a, moment, a, a different dark ethereal realm where he and Satala are talking in a weird way that happens in the web novel. But it's like a one pass thing where everything is instantaneous and now he realizes, oh shit, I literally was cheering for a child to be dropped off. For the anime only watching this video, I would love to hear what you think Sirius' authority is in the comments. I think that Sirius' authority is basically what we saw in the show. It's simple. She has the power to connect everyone their hearts as one by compelling them, by having them, you know, look at her. Just basically, if, her, if your attention has been given to Sirius and she does a clap or something, it's over. Maybe not over, but you're going to be in that trance-like state. And the more that she goes on and on and on, the more that people, hearts become one, the emotions become one, and then the eyes become red when the damage sharing effect happens, I think. Which is even crazier because, what do you remember? from the episode when we were in the morning making those pancakes, a radio broadcast happened. Think about if Sirius has access to that radio broadcast. Her voice can be heard across the entire city of Pristilla. Forget that little town hall where Sirius was at. If she can potentially unite everyone's heart as one simply through the broadcast radio media, I think that we are incredibly fucked. But also the other way. If Liliana, I think that Liliana's songs will counter that trance-like hypnotism. Maybe she too can get on the fucking broadcast and just fucking play her songs. I'm not sure. Below, at any novel reader spoiling people will get boomed. Season 3 episode 1 did a fantastic job setting up a huge conflict. Regulus's appearance, the talk of the city being a trap and messing with water levels. Reinhardt saying he can arrive in 5 seconds. One second for Felt though. Sirius's entrance along with her last name and her very obvious elf ears. The broadcast meteor and more. All 90 Like is it that simple? Is Sirius really just Fortuna? 
Is it just that simple? Because I was like, maybe Juice and Fortune are fucked. But here's the thing. A spirit cannot have kids. A spirit cannot have kids nor a parent. It just exists. This cannot be the love child of Fortuna and Juice. Now, could it be Fortuna? Definitely could be. 100% could be. It doesn't matter if the voice actor is different. That is not enough to disprove this notion, right? If the voice actor is the same, then that's 100% evidence. But just because the voice actor is different, it does not mean that this is not Fortuna. Fortuna's body magically disappeared. When Emilia went berserk and froze everything, Juice and Pandora walked away with Juice laughing. But Fortuna was on the ground. And Frozen Bomb when we melted everything. You see Fortuna's body? Does anybody have Fortuna's body? I don't remember seeing that shit. I mean... Romani Conti. Elf features. The band-aids to hide everything about her face. It screams Fortuna. But with the show like ReZero, I feel like it's too easy of a guess. It has to be more complex than that. But sometimes, here's the thing. The show preys on you overthinking. Sometimes a simple answer is just that answer. And people overthink and they forget, they, 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 they get literally tripped up when the answer is so simple, but they want to make it seem like it's deeper than it is, and then they delude themselves from the truth. Who knows? For very obvious elf ears, the broadcast meteor, and more. All 90 minutes of this episode were used to set up benchmarks for characters so we could tell what's going on with them and how they've changed over the year while introducing all new conflicts for them. The inherent conflict of the royal selection, the Sin Archbishops descending upon the city, the weapon-like structure of the city itself, and the Estrella family drama. We are set up for a bombastic first core, but mm -hmm. now, let's talk about what didn't make it into the anime. Let's go, Kai Content! Me. To start, you may have noticed Subaru's lack of surprise about the notion of someone from Japan being influential in the founding of Kawaragi and its architect. Yes, because Season 1 cut content, Al, Priscilla, Cart, Priscilla, they all talk about um, uh, how Al is from B Beyond the Great Waterfall. Al is an isekai character, and Anastasia also directly refers to Hoshino the Wilderness in Season 1 cut content. Texture. This is ripped straight from the novel. The main problem is that with the novel, you can't give me a time and say it's more trailers. You need to give me a time stamp, a literal range of what I'm not allowed to watch. When you say 1253, what does that mean? Does it start at 1253? For how long? Where do I click off? You need to give me a range where I can't watch because simple times does not mean anything. There being other people who were isekai was actually included. The anime technically included this on Flugel's tree by writing Flugel was here in Katakana, mm, but it flew under too. a lot of radars. And the anime completely cut out Aldebron being from Japan. So does that basically confirm that Flugel is Japanese? Does that confirm that Flugel is Japanese? Flugel was here. It was on Flugel's tree. Could someone, like Hoshin of the Wilderness, wrote Flugel is here on behalf of Flugel, you know? So basically, when we get to 1253, I will just do this. And I'm not gonna, I'm only gonna play the video, I'm not gonna look at the visuals. Pan. You can find more information about these in some of my cut content videos. Yes, sir. I discussed earlier how they half re added some content. They mentioned that a Laguna Canoba was kidnapped as a baby 15 Felt. years ago, but what they didn't include is that Felt is suspected to be that noble. Yes. <laughs> Hair color, eye color, fang. Hence why Reinhardt reacted the way he did and took her in. While they re-added part of the cut content, they cut another portion from the Subaru and Julius conversation. First, Julius mentions that due to Reinhardt's relationship with Heinkel as son and father, the kingdom warriors that if Heinkel gave Reinhardt an insane order, Reinhardt would do it without question. Thus, the kingdom does what they can to keep Heinkel in a good mood. And second, Heinkel is suspected of involvement in the kidnapping of a royal 15 years. What is these, his patrons? ...years ago, however, there is no conclusive proof. And finally, Heinkel is the- Alright guys, I'm gonna prime myself to avoid spoilers. It starts from 1253. ...one who had Teresia go to the White Whale that lost her life, as Heinkel refused to take part. So- Heinkel, you fucking pussy. But again, do I expect Heinkel to substitute Teresia? Hell no. If, like, there's, 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 it doesn't matter if Heinkel went or not, he wouldn't have been fucking helpful in my opinion. Well, there are the bits and pieces that do not make it in about Heinkel. It's possible they are added later, but just in case they aren't, there you go. Okay. That will also wrap up our episode 1 video. I won't talk about what I think of it as an adaptation, as I already did that in a previous video, which you can watch here. So until next week, that'll be all.
Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure you... And then the rest is just ads. That's pretty much it. That was a pretty good video. That was a pretty good video. If there's any other, you know, channels that you want me to check out and check out their extra good content or easier content, please let me know. Here's the link to Mr. Asarathas. Asaratha. 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 Ratha. Asaratha. Please go give him a like on the video. Sub to his channel if you haven't, and I'll see you next time.